just take a few moments to offer to God his word. Lord, we thank you that you have left your word with us, your inspired word. Mm. Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is trying to say to us as a congregation here this morning, but also as individuals. Lord, would you be with me as I speak what I feel you've placed upon my heart. Mm. Lord, would we grow deeper in you, in the things of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so, if you want a title, because I know not some of you like a title, um, today's title for you could be Trust God in the Adventure. And we've spoken a lot about trust and having faith in God this morning already. And some of my thoughts come to you not from this book, which mainly it does, you'll be pleased to know, who is grounded in this. Um, but some of my thoughts come to you from this book which I have read so many times now, it is countless. I can even read this book without opening the pages that I know it off by heart. Um, and so some of my thoughts come from this book. For those of you that are sat here going, what is that book? Um, which I'm sure most of you know this book. Um, I'm going on a bear hunt. And it's about a family that go on an adventure Mum and Dad leave them in the care of the older brother and they go on an adventure to find a bear. And they soon realise there's many things on this adventure that get in their way. But they can't go over it, they can't go under it, they have to go through it. And as I've read this book <laughs> so many times, it was only a couple of weeks ago I really pondered on that thought of we've got to go through it. And what that means to us as Christians here today, as people of God, that we have to go through it. There isn't an easy option. Following Christ is not an easy option. Being a follower of God doesn't mean that we get a quick route or an easy route. And when I looked at the words journey and adventure and the difference in the dictionary, because quite often we talk about that we journey with God. It's quite interesting. You would think there's not much of a difference between going on a journey and going on an adventure. And you might argue these people went on a journey. You might say they went on an adventure. So a journey in the dictionary is Travelling from one place to another, usually taking a rather long time, a distance, a course, an area travelled. The dictionary says that an adventure is an exciting or very unusual experience. Participation in exciting undertaking or enterprises, the spirit of adventure. When I think about living a life as a follower of Jesus, it's often described as a journey. But many of us know that it's not easy. And we've sat here this morning, some of us know that it's difficult. There are still sufferings, there is still hardship. Life is tough sometimes. And we should never think that being a follower of Jesus is the easy option. But this morning I want us to go on an adventure together and think about following Jesus as an adventure. Because sometimes it feels like that for some of us. Some of us, you know, might easily get from A to B. Some of us have more difficulties. It takes more faith, more patience maybe for some of us.
And in this simple children's book, we can see and help us go deeper in him. So first of all, we see here a family. We are a family. This is more than a community. It's a family, a perfect description of these beautiful images. A family going on an adventure. And in the coming weeks, we will probably, in our local area, see many families on adventures over the summer as we see tourists flock to our wonderful Dorset coasts and we'll see many people going on an adventure. We are a family of God. God calls us to be a family, to watch out for one another, to journey with one another on the adventure, to be alongside one another in the hard times and in the good times. And we see this in scripture. Don't worry, we're coming back to the source. We're not sticking with we're going on a bit, I promise. And we see it on the adventure of the children of Israel as they adventure to find the promised land. So if you do have your Bible with me, with you, this morning, a physical version or a technical version. We're going to turn to Exodus 14, 13, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 31. So Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and they will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his armies, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been travelling in front of the Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. A pillar of cloud was moved from in front and stood behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground, and the wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptians' army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the water may flow back over the Egyptians and the chariots and the horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at the daybreak the sea went back into place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, no, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on the dry, dry ground and the wall of their water, the wall of water on the right and on the left. The day of the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him, in Moses, his servant. 
the water was in front of them. And Pharaoh and his army were behind them. They were trapped and they had three options. Surrender, fight or trust God. They knew they can't go over it. They can't go under it and they can't get around it. They knew they had one option. They had to go through it and to go through it, they had to put their trust in God. They had to put their trust in him. We have to put our trust in God. Even in the days ahead that seem fearful, that we are afraid, we have to stand on the knowledge of knowing that we serve an almighty God who is faithful and trustworthy. And we have to put our trust in God. I love that in this scripture, it's a declaration of who God is. Moses stands and he speaks to the people. The Lord will fight for you. Do not be afraid. And so often, like Sandra shared already this morning, and everything is flowing so beautifully, that sometimes we can become poorly unwell, or our circumstances around us can feel so overwhelming that we focus on what's ahead of us and not what our God is able to do. That our God is able to take us through the roughest of storms. Our God is able to take us through the roughest of seas. He's not going to give us the easy option. He's going to say, yeah, we'll go through it. And it's going to be tough. But trust in me. Because I am a God who is able. Trust in God. And the greatest of things is that we are not alone in this adventure. They didn't walk alone through that beautiful picture of those seas separated. And I'm sure through our childhood or growing up, we've seen imagery of that beautiful picture of that sea separating and people's interpretation of what that may have looked like. And our God is able to part the seas when we put our trust in him, when we are faithful servants of God. We hear his voice. But he doesn't call us to do it alone. The Israelites walked through together. Together they went. And we're here for one another together. Together. I can't do it for you. I can't be, suffer the sickness for you in that same way. But I can stand with you and believe that our God is a healer. I can stand with you and say whatever you need. Let's journey and adventure this together. My next point is the adventure of knowing who we are. When we look at this children's book, we see a family of differing ages, of differing genders, of differing abilities, of differing qualities. And these things don't qualify us to be better than the next person and how we live our life for God. I want us to look, and some of you won't be surprised, at the story of Esther. And it's a story that I love very much, but I think again we can see part of this story through the story of Esther, that where we see that God has placed someone in a position and a place for such a time. We see Esther as a young Jewish girl and she shouldn't have never been in the position of being in the palace and yet she found herself in a position of great potential and great opportunity and great favour. In Esther 4, 14, it says these words, For if you remain in silence at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? But you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So we see in this moment that Esther realises that she is in a position of great favour 
for a reason. And she tells Mordecai to go and to ask the other Jews to fast and takes her opportunity as she steps into the palace, a place where she has no permission to be. And she walks into the throne room, just hoping as she walks towards the king that she will be granted permission by him reaching out his scepter to grant the permission for her to be in the throne room. She couldn't walk around the throne room. She couldn't walk under. She couldn't walk over. She had to walk in. She had to walk through to gain that approval, to realise that she was in a position of great favour. She had found favour with the king to save a generation. And favour is what opens the doors that no man can shut. Favour is what puts you in places that you have no business of being in. Favour is what sets you in positions that you know you aren't qualified for. Favour is what makes it set for you to be able to accomplish exactly what God wants you to accomplish. It's what qualifies you when you have no degrees, you have no qualifications, you have no connections. You are just where God has opened a door and people speak badly of you maybe. They try to push you out, but you, have, you cannot be moved because the Spirit of God has placed you where you are. The favour of God is a wonderful thing. I stand here this morning with, as someone that didn't get a lot of GCSEs, didn't get a lot of A-levels, I don't have a degree, I don't have a diploma, I struggled to read, and yet I remember as a teenage girl opening up this word in the middle of my grandfather's living room, and something came alive within me when I read it that day. I'm not qualified to stand in a pulpit and preach the word of God. I don't feel qualified to stand here in my own strength, but it's of who God is and what he has placed within me. And because of his grace and favour, that's why I'm stood here. It's not me. It's who he is. It's who he is. It's who he is. You have a choice to live it out. Just as Mordecai said to Esther, but if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. From another place. She had to recognise that she was in a position that had great favour. But there was a job to be done. Sometimes we are placed in great places. But we have to acknowledge that there's a job to be done. When Christ died on Calvary, the perfect sacrifice was presented, making it possible for all who believe to enjoy God's favour. We read in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, it says, For he says, in the time of favour I heard you, on the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour, now is the day of salvation. It's in his presence we overcome. Let's turn to Mark 4, verse 35, where we read 
Mark's version of the calming of the storm. That day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. <coughs> there were also other boats with him. A, fu a furious squirrel came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I have read this story many times. But over the last few weeks, I began to see as I was studying details in it that maybe a fresh revelation that I hadn't really seen before. We see that in this storybook, as we read it, there's a slight fear and trepidation about going on a bear hunt, but yet there's a slight excitement as well. And sometimes that's true of life. When we go into things, new things, go on adventures, there's that slight, okay, yeah, this is a little exciting, but I'm not going to admit that I'm a bit scared. I'm a bit scared. I'm a bit frightened. This is quite fearful. And yet, the children and family in this book go out with such excitement. And we see in this story, Jesus falling asleep during the storm. And the disciples are challenged by Jesus. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Do you have no faith? Let's take a few minutes to explore what Mark tells us. You also can read this story in Luke. And Mark gives us a few more details about the situation that's going on that maybe Luke doesn't tell us. He tells us more detail about Jesus, where Jesus was on the boat. He tells us that Jesus was in the stern of the boat, the lowest part of the boat. He tells us some details about the storm, how ferocious, I can't even say that word, ferocious it was and the waves were coming over the boat. I think Mark is trying to get us to understand is that Jesus was in the lowest part of the boat so he would have been feeling the real effects of that storm and yet what was Jesus still doing? Sleeping. Peacefully, quietly sleeping. He had no fear. There was no fear. We know that the Christian life, that we shouldn't fear anything because we know that God is a God of the impossible and he's on our side and all things are possible with God. And just as Jesus gets frustrated and challenged by the disciples about their faith, when they become fearful of the storm, it's hard when we finally come up against something that's fearful in re reality. It's exciting, but actually when the storm comes in, when we're faced with the reality of the situation, when we're faced with the reality of the bear, it's not so fun and exciting anymore. The fear can overtake us. Everything that we are called to be, in his presence, we keep our eyes on the things that matter then we are healed, we are strengthened. Spending time with God in his word, in prayer, in worship, changes the atmosphere wherever we are, in his presence. The animation of this story adds something to the book that some of you may have never 
scene. And I don't know if you've seen the animation of it. It's on Channel 4 a few Christmases ago. And as they go on the bear hunt, it likes, the book tells you that then they approach the bear and then they get scared and they run away. But the animation version, like all these animations, likes to add a little bit extra. And so you see the girl whose idea it was in the first place to go on this bear hunt. When they find the bear, she finds it first. And she approaches the bear. She's not scared. She doesn't want to run away from it. She wants to befriend the bear. And then her family behind her appear because they've lost her for a little bit. And they go, ah, it's the bear! And they run back through and then the story tells you that they run through everything that they've gone through before, back to the house, into mum and dad's bed where they're safe. And they end the words by, we're never going on a bear hunt ever again. And we see this little girl, she's then slowly getting pulled along on the animation version because she doesn't want to run away from the bear. She's realised that actually he's not as scary as maybe they thought he was. That perhaps he's not something to run away from. And I think this is a lovely picture of how God would like us to be. That life can be scary. It can be fearful at times, but yet we are called to be set apart. We are called to approach things in a different way. To be secure and knowing that we are loved and created. We are called different names than the world would like to name us. We are called to be set apart, to be different, to respond to situations in a different way so that your colleagues say, oh, I didn't expect you to respond like that in a compassionate and loving way. Because we are trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That we are generous with our time, that we are loving and kind that we are the hands and feet of Jesus as he's called us to be. Go and make disciples. And as people see a difference in us, they want to know more. They want to know why didn't you respond like that? Why don't you live your life like that? Why don't you do that? Why do you choose to go there and not there? And as maybe we tell them our story and our adventure and the testimony of who God is in us, hope would arise, salvation would arise, that fear would have no place but truth would break through. God spends a lot of time in his word telling us who we are. It's almost like he knew that we would doubt that from time to time. He knew that we are perfect, that we are humans, that we doubt things, that we become anxious. We are set that way. We are human beings. We become anxious. We become worried. And yet there is so much talk in scripture about don't be afraid, do not worry. Don't be anxious for anything. It's as if he saw it coming, that we spend our whole lives searching for what our identity is in him. So let's look for a few quick minutes, well not, maybe less than, about a couple of those things that Jesus says. So in John 15, 15, he calls us friend. In 1 Thessalonians 1.4, he calls us chosen. I don't expect you to find these, Steve. I'm going to go quick. Ephesians 2.10, he calls us his workmanship. He calls us his art. He calls us handmade. He calls us purpose. He calls us 
fashioned for good things. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he calls my body a temple. He calls it the residence of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1, 8, he calls me his messenger to the world. In Galatians 3, 26, he calls me his child. In Romans 5, 8, he calls me greatly loved. In John 8, 36, he calls me free, free indeed. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he calls me brand new. The names the world may like to offer, and yet the names the word of God tells us we are. The labels that people may place on you, yet the names that God says that you are. God even uses the word fear when he says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are chosen, we are set apart, we are his workmanship, we are free, free indeed. We are brand new, we are greatly loved. You are greatly loved by a God who is able to do exceedingly more than we can ask or imagine, a God who took the Israelites through the middle of the sea, a God that placed a small Jewish girl where she should not have been in a place of great favour and potential and opportunity to save a generation. That is the God we serve still today in 2023. He is a God who is more than we can think, ask or imagine. And he's my God. And he's your God. And he's greater than any of the gods that the world can offer. Any news headline, any sickness, any disease, any disaster, our God, he is able. So when we stand on that shoreline and look at the sea, when we stood in that boat when we look at the storm, when we stood at the doors of the throne room thinking, I don't have permission to go in there. Know that, okay, you can't go over it. You can't go around it. You've got to go through it. But you're going through it with a God on your side who is more than able. So just like that little girl, when you get to the other side and maybe you meet the circumstances that you dreaded the most or the thing that you were, the news that you were dreading the most or the things that you are most fearful of, that actually you can react in a different way. You don't have to run, but you can face it head on just like David faced the Goliath. Because we serve a God who is able, that we put our trust in. And I don't stand here this morning saying these words, knowing that it's an easy life to live. That we can just build ourselves up here and go out and that's great. It's hard. Like Sandra's testified this morning, it's hard when you're in it. It's difficult to remember all of the great things that he calls us. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, The triumphant over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It's in the testimonies when we go through it. It's in the testimony of what God does when we feel that freedom, when we see his work, and the beauty of it. How wonderful he is. How beautiful he is. How marvellous he is. As we sing song this morning. And as we testify. 
All glory goes to him. And we see him working. We see him working. We're not scared, are we? Well, maybe sometimes. But we come here each week to catch the rhythm of hunting for a king. Hunting for a king in our shared stories, in our family. Then being sent out to find the king in the suffering of our world. Seeking healing, seeking transformation. We come here each week to celebrate and to be built up by who God is in testimony, in worship and word that we would see in our world, in our broken world, our Saviour receive the reward for his suffering. Let's trust in him on the adventure. I want to end this morning by saying these words, and I'm not going to take any credit for them. I found them on the internet and I read them and thought, this is great. It finishes what I've been saying in a great way. We're going on a king hunt. We're going to take part in transforming lives from suffering to new life. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Oh look, a baptismal pool. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've already gone through it. Splish. Splash, dying, rising for me. We're going on a king hunt. We're going to take part in transforming institutions from injustice to justice. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Oh look, the institution of the communion table. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've already gathered around it. Eating, drinking, body, blood, given for all. We're going on a king hunt. We're being sent out, working together to transform lives. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Amen. Let's stand together. Father God, we know that the storms of life, they come, and sometimes we feel so inadequate in our human strength, and yet we thank you that because of your son dying for us upon Calvary, for shedding his blood, for dying on the cross, to entering that tomb and three days later rising again in victory. Lord, as we've sung this morning, you reign victorious, forever glorious. And because you do, Lord, we can stand in the knowledge of who you have called us to be, knowing that you are Christ in us, the hope of glory to the world that you have set us apart, that you have called us to trust in you on this great adventure. And Lord, we do trust in you. And Lord, we want to see this town changed for you. We want to see this county changed for you. We want to see our nation changed for you. We want to see our world changed for you. And Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters that have come and gone over the years that have fellowshiped in our family and gone on a wonderful adventure 
following what they believe you have called them to go on to the next part of their adventure into different parts of this nation to other nations and it builds us all up knowing that you are working among us Lord, we ask that you would be with every single one of us, that we would be reminded again that you call us so many wonderful names in your word. And on those days where maybe we're feeling like we are a little bit scared, that we are a little bit afraid, maybe the day doesn't feel so beautiful, that you would take us to your word. That we would bathe ourselves in worship. Because we know that in the atmosphere of your presence, things can change. Four patterns can change. Atmosphere can change where you are. You make a difference. Lord, I ask that you would be with every single one of us here this morning. Lord, and our brothers and sisters watching online. Lord, that we would leave this place knowing who we are in you. And we put our trust in that. We put our faith in that. On Christ, the solid rock, we will stand. Amen. Lord, bless us now as we come together and fellowship with one another. Lord, that in, this, in those relationships as well, you would be seen and that we would know your touch. In Jesus' name.